بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We'll go ahead and start. Inshallah, the others usually show up a few minutes late anyway, because um, I would like to finish by six or six ten at most. Inshallah. All right. So we finished at verse twenty-four. Um, today is the second last session, and then Inshallah Sunday will be the final part. Uh, my plan is to cover ten ayat today. Nine or ten, but let's see, inshallah. All right, so uh, previously, the previous ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you remember, He described the characteristics of the people of Jannah. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will describe the characteristics of the wicked people, those who end up in the fire. And this is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way of Allah, right? His tradition, His methodology. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says something regarding Jannah, or describing Jannah, or describing its people, you will see that right away Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the opposite. He describes the actions that lead to the fire, or he'll describe the fire, or the people of the fire. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is from the wisdom of speech, clarity in speech, that he gives um, one side and its polar opposite. So it is extremely clear about the message. Like, Let's say the wall is white and it was not black. This gives more clarity, right? That you know the exact opposites. You know it was white and definitely it wasn't black or didn't have any black spots or whatever the case. So this is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He speaks throughout the Qur'an to give clarity and to make people have the entire message and not be confused about anything. All right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 25, وَالَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِيثَاقِهِ وَيَكَطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُصَلَ وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a few characteristics of the people of the fire. The first thing he said, the people, those and those, وَالَّذِينَ <coughs> and those يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِيثَاقِهِ And those who break the covenant, a pact, a promise, a covenant that they make, uh, a covenant, the covenant of Allah, that ahd Allahi min ba'di mithaqihi. They make that covenant, and after it has been confirmed, so the, the deal has been sealed, even after that, they break, yanquduna, they break the covenant, even after it's been fully prepared, fully agreed upon, and completely sealed completely agreed upon, they still go back and betray that covenant. And we mentioned this hadith before, a couple of uh, sessions back, and we'll mention this again because it applies to this ayah as well. In the hadith that's muttafaqun alayh, collected and agreed upon in both Bukhari and Muslim, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, min alamatil munafiqi thalathatun. There are three characteristics to the hypocrite. وَإِنْ صَامَ وَصَلَّ وَزَعَمَ أَنَّهُ مُسْلِمٌ Even if he were to fast and pray and testify that he's a Muslim, it doesn't matter. Even though you see him do these things, it doesn't matter. He's still, he's actually a munafiq. What are those three characteristics? إِذَا حَدَّثَ كَذَبْ Whenever he speaks, he lies. وَإِذَا وَعَدَ أَخْلَفَ وَإِذَا تُؤْمِنَ خَانَ And then, when he makes a promise, he breaks it. And when he is trusted, he betrays the trust. In the other narration that's from Abdullah ibn Amr uh, radiallahu anhuma, and this is in Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in that narration, Arba'un man kunna fihi kana munafiqan khalisan. Four characteristics. If someone has these four correct characteristics, then he is munafiqan khalisan. He is a pure and absolute, total munafiq. There's no doubts about it. So if one has these four characteristics. So in that narration, he mentioned these three characteristics. And then also the addition uh, sentence there. وَإِذَا عَاهَدَ غَدَرَ وَإِذَا خَاصَمَ فَجَرَ When he makes a covenant. وَإِذَا عَاهَدَ غَدَرَ Whenever he makes a covenant. He betrays, he breaks that covenant. وَإِذَا خَاصَمَ fajara. And whenever you argue with him, he is the most wretched person and he's all about 
uh, he proves to be the most wretched, quarrelsome person. So these are all attributes of munafiqan khalisan. Kana, afihi kana munafiqan khalisan. That they are total, there's no doubt, they are hypocrites. All right, so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, وَيَقْطَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُصَلْ And they cut, يَقْطَعُونَ They cut, they sever the ties of the, uh, the they sever the relationship that is formed with uh, kinship. They sever the ties of kinship or they sever or cut off the relationship that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded us to fulfill. That's another characteristic of the people of the fire. Let's say uh, in families, spouses, children, parents, siblings, Allah commanded us to have a close bond with each other. So those who intentionally cut off these relationships with their family, uh, cousin, uncle, aunt, whatever, uh, relatives, then of course this is uh, a major sin and uh, it is from the characteristics of the people of the fire. Then Allah also mentioned, in this ayah, verse, uh, verse 25, وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ And they spread, uh, evil, they spread mischief across the earth. They themselves do haram things, they themselves do wrong things, but they're not satisfied with just that. They actually spread. They go around spreading that mischief to other people as well. أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْلَعْنَةِ And upon these people, so Allah described the people of the hellfire, they break the covenants. They uh, they cut off the ties of kinship. They uh, they are people who spread mischief. So these people, ulaika lahumul la'na. Upon them is the curse of Allah subhanahu wa taala. La'natullah. They are cursed by Allah, or the curse of Allah is upon them. Ulaika lahumul la'na. Whenever you see this word that the la'na of Allah or the la'na of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is upon something. So in this specific ayah, we see that those who break their covenant, those who tie, uh, cut the ties of kinship, those who spread mischief, those who are mufsidun, these people are cursed by Allah. In a hadith, you're going to see, uh, for example, the Prophet ﷺ, anyone who said, any man or woman who gets tattoos, they are cursed by Allah. And they are cursed by the Prophet ﷺ. Women who pluck their eyebrows are cursed by Allah and His Messenger. So you will find verses and also a hadith where some of the major sins are mentioned that bring the curse of Allah and His Messenger ﷺ upon the doer of that sin. So what does it mean that somebody is cursed by Allah? Curse, the curse of Allah, and we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from receiving his curse. If somebody is cursed by Allah, it means that he has been removed from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Shaitan is cursed by Allah, and Allah made it very clear in the Quran that the la'na of Allah is upon Iblis. And he is cursed till the day of resurrection, and he will be in Jahannam through eternity. So, as shaytan al-rajim, he is the one who has been far removed from the mercy of Allah, he's been cursed by Allah, al-rajim, the outcast, he is thrown out. So, uh, the word shaytan, it is, me, the meaning is that it, he has been removed, far removed from the mercy of Allah, he's been cursed by Allah, and al-rajim, of course, he's the outcast, uh, he's been thrown out, he's, he's the nuisance. Of, of, and the enemy of mankind. So, ulaika lahumul la'na. Now, why is receiving the mercy of Allah so important? And of course, this is the month of Ramadan, a month in which, insha'Allah, we strive to earn the rahmah of Allah. If somebody is cursed by Allah, there is no jannah for this person. In the hadith that is muttafaqun alayhi, collected and agreed upon, uh, agreed upon and collected in both Bukhari and Muslim. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فَإِنَّهُ لَنْ, لَنْ, never, right? يُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ أَحَدًا عَمَلُهُ For sure, you will never, one of you will never enter Jannah just by 
his or her good deeds. Amaluhu. Just because you offer salah, just because you're fasting, just because you give charity, just because you stay away from haram, none of you can enter Jannah just because of doing the deeds that Allah told you to do. قَالُوا وَلَا أَنْتَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ So the Sahaba who were sitting there, they asked, not even you, O Allah's Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, وَلَا أَنَا Not even me. Just by deeds alone, we cannot enter Jannah. Not even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدَنِ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَةِ إِلَّا أَنْ يَتَغَمَّدَنِ اللَّهُ بِرَحْمَةِ Unless Allah bestows His Rahmah upon me. Without the Rahmah of Allah, not a single human being, not even Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is allowed to enter or can enter Jannah. So when you see, brothers and sisters, a hadith or an ayah that says the curse of Allah is upon this doer, please understand the severity of this. The la'na of Allah means being removed from the Rahmah of Allah. And without the Rahmah of Allah, it does not matter how many good deeds you do in life, you will never فَإِنَّهُ لَنْ يُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ لَنْ is in the future tense, meaning you will never enter paradise. Right? If this was not allowed for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa it is not going to be allowed for you and me. Period. So we need the rahmah of Allah. We need to avoid the sins that bring the la'na of Allah. وَلَهُمْ Continuing on, وَلَهُمْ سُوءُ الدَّارُ And for them is an evil home. This is the second time in this surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions clearly that Jahannam, that Jahannam is an evil destination. It's an evil home. Walahum su'uddar. If you remember in verse 18, Allah had mentioned regarding Jahannam, وَمَأْوَاهُمْ Jahannam wa bi'sal mihad. They will, their uh, dwelling place will be Jahannam, wa bi'sal mihad. What a horrible. What a horrible place to live in. So in verse 25, Allah is saying, وَلَهُمْ سُوءُ الدَّارِ This is an evil home. A horrible home, terrible home, evil place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us that these are the things that lead to the fire, and the fire is a terrible place to live in. I'm warning you. So let's move on to verse 26. In verse 26, Allah says, Allahu yabsutu rizqa liman yasha'u wa yaqdir. It is Allah alone who increases uh, the, the rizq liman yasha' for whomever he wishes wa yaqdir. Or he uh, restricts the rizq, rizq for whomever he wishes. <coughs> so Allah makes it very clear. He is a razzaq we know this. He's reminding the people, the pagans of Quraysh, he's reminding the believers that you will never control how much you earn. You can work for it, you can try. But whether that attempt will succeed or fail, this is in Allah's decision alone. He determines who gets how much money, he determines who will eat how much, he determines who will eat, wear clothing, how much, how much clothing, where he'll live, how's the size and things like that. <coughs> All of this is determined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And He does it as He wishes for whom He wishes. The reason being, the mushrikun at that time and even today, just because they have lots of money and fancy cars and uh, you, you know humongous mansions and lots of clothing and lots of food, throughout human history, the mushrikun have been this way, that if they are rich, wealthy, they think they are the successful people. They think this is it, they made it, they're blessed. So Allah reminds the mushrikun that even your wealth, all of what you are eating and drinking and wearing, this is my doing. If I didn't want to, you wouldn't get this. To strike them, to make them realize this fact. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Mu'minun, in a different verse, أَيَحْسَبُونَ أَنَّمَا نُمَدِّهُمْ بِهِ مِنْ مَالٍ وَبَنِينَ Do they think that just because we extend to them wealth and children, نُسَارِعُوا لَهُمْ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ بَلَّا يَشْعُرُونَ 
just because we gave them a lot of money and a lot of children, do they think that we have rushed the good deed for them? نُسَارِعُ لَهُمْ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ Do they think that this dunya, this is it? They've, they've attained Jannah in this dunya? That's what they think? بَلْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ Rather, they have no perception. These mushrikun, they don't think. And even the, not just mushrikun, even the Muslims who might fall under this. Oh, I have a really high education. I have lots of money. I have a really nice paying job. So that's it. I'm done. I, I'm blessed. I have been, yes, of course, it's a blessing from Allah. You always thank Him and you never forget Him. You know that all of this happened because Allah made it happen. So you should worship Allah more in, in order to thank Him. But many people don't do that, sadly. So uh, then Allah says, uh, continues, وَفَرِحُوا بِالْحَيَاةِ dunya." So these people who think that they have all these risks, forgetting that it is Allah who controls it, وَفَرِحُوا بِالْحَيَاةِ dunya." They rejoice, they become super happy. Yeah, I got all these things. So they think that's it, they made it. They are the successful people. وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا مَتَاعِ And the life of this dunya, Compared to the life of the Akhirah, illa mata'. It is nothing but a temporary passing enjoyment. This dunya life is temporary. The Akhirah is eternal. There's no time limit. So how can you compare this dunya life to the Akhirah? So this is why Allah says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا مَتَاعِ This dunya life compared to the Akhirah, it's nothing but just a passing of time. Just as some little enjoyment and a passing of time. And Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, related to this thing, uh, related to this concept, قُلْ مَتَاعُ الدُّنْيَا قَلِيلٌ وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لِمَنِ اتَّقَى وَتُظْلَمُونَ وَلَا تُظْلَمُونَ فَتِيلًا Tell the people that this مَتَاعُ الدُّنْيَا قَلِيلٌ this passing time of this dunya is qalil, is very small. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's very small. وَالْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لِمَنِ اتَّقَى But the hereafter is, um, the hereafter is much better, is better. لِمَنِ اتَّقَى For the people who have taqwa. And in, in a hadith in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Wallahi, ma dunya fil akhirah illa mithlu ma yaj'alu ahadukum isba'uhu hadihi wa ashara yahyi bis sababati. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, this life of this dunya, as compared to the life of the akhirah, is like if one of you should uh, take his finger and then he made the uh, ashara, he made the ishara, meaning he, he raised his finger and he uh, showed it to the people. That if you take this finger, that you take one finger and you dip it in the ocean, you take the finger out, look as to how much water is stuck to the finger. That is the dunya and the ocean is the akhirah. It's nothing. I mean, seriously, if we go, you know, uh, go to the ocean, dip one finger in, what does it, <laughs> it does nothing. It does not reduce from the ocean by the least. It just, your finger just gets wet. That's the dunya. The finger getting wet is the dunya, and the entire ocean is the akhirah. So he made this analogy to make people understand this ayah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا فِي الْآخِرَةِ إِلَّا مَتَاعِ There is no comparing. And if you were to compare, this dunya life is just a passing of time. The akhirah is the eternal life. Alright, so let's go to verse 27. وَيَقُولُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَوْ لَا أُنزِلَ عَلَيْهِ آيَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِ قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُضِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي إِلَيْهِ مَنْ أَنَابٍ so the disbelievers, the kuffar, they say, what did they say to the Prophet ﷺ? If only a miracle had come down from his Lord, we'll believe him. 
because they didn't understand that the Quran, these words that Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reciting, this is the miracle. That the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he died a complete illiterate man. It was praiseworthy for him. That being illiterate is not praiseworthy for us. All right, so understand the difference. <laughs> Once you know, kids look for all types of excuses. So they're like, oh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was uneducated. He didn't go to school, or they didn't even know how to read or write. So I don't have to do good in school. <laughs> but that's not the understanding, right? It is a miracle and it is praiseworthy that a prophet, that a human being who did not even know how to read or write till the day he died, he ended up in his grave without ever learning how to read or write, uneducated. How could he recite these verses of the Quran? How could he recite, come up with such amazing ayat? How is he able to recite these things, an uneducated man? So Allah kept him uneducated in terms of reading and writing. But of course, in education, in terms of ilm, he was the boss of all bosses, right? No one is going to exceed Muhammad sallallahu in terms of ilm, of life and akhirah and the deen. We know that. But in terms of reading and writing, he was uneducated. And Allah did that from his infinite wisdom. It's a miracle. So for him, it was a miracle. But for us, it is frowned upon. Even the Prophet ﷺ forbade us to be illiterate. We have to learn. As Muslim men and women, we have to have some type of education, bi'idnillah, and especially education of our religion. So they said, if only, why is it that a sign, an, an ayah min rabbihi, an ayah, a miracle, or a, or a sign from his Lord, if only that was sent down, we'd believe. Disbelievers ask for miracles. They've asked for miracles. As we know from the Quran, every single messenger was asked, show me this miracle, show me that miracle. They took this as a challenge. And of course, they didn't believe. The Prophet or the messenger, بِإِذْنِلَّهِ By the permission of Allah, he showed the miracles. But the people, they ended up still rejecting. And then Allah destroyed the entire nation. Right? The Quran is filled with such stories. In the hadith, um, it's mentioned that the Quraysh, they came to the Prophet ﷺ. What were these miracles? Uh, that if only a miracle was sent down. What was the miracle? They said that a Safa turned this entire Safa into gold. Make it a gold mountain for us. <coughs> they also asked, you know, this is Mecca. It's a desert area. So remove all these desert the sand and the mountains that you see and perform a miracle make make you know uh, springs like rivers and and lakes gush forth so the whole area becomes green it becomes a green area not a barren desert and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu through Jibreel if you want of course Allah can do this and Allah will give them what they are asking for. However, if they refuse you, even after these miracles, tar turn Safa into gold, no problem. Allah will say, Kun, Fayakun. Remove the deserts and turn, put lakes and rivers and make the entire uh, desert area green, filled with green, no problem. Kun, Fayakun. That's all Allah has to do. Say, Be, and it is. He's Rabbul Alameen. So Allah told the Prophet ﷺ, through Jibreel, I can give these challenges that they're asking for, these miracles. However, if they refuse after them, after the miracles are shown up, they will be annihilated, just like the previous nations. So what, what do you want? The Prophet ﷺ, because he was Nabiyul Rahma, And of course, Allah is, is Al-Alim. He knows what the Prophet is going to ask for. But this is to show us he was Nabiyul Rahma. What did the Prophet ﷺ ask for? for from Allah instead. Don't give these miracles because if they reject you're going to destroy them, don't do that. Rather, بَلْ تَفْتَحُ لَهُمْ بَابَ التَّوْبَةِ وَالرَّحْمَةِ Rather, I want you, O oh Allah, to leave the door of tawbah and rahmah open for them. Regardless of how much they are rejecting you, regardless of how evil they are, if one day they stumble upon Islam and they hear about Islam, they read about Islam and they are convinced of Islam and become Muslim, they are showered with rahmah, they are showered with tawbah, 
and their life is wiped clean. It's a new beginning. Right? So this is the dua and the request that the Prophet ﷺ made. And this is why, brothers and sisters, you will never see the Muslim ummah being destroyed altogether. You have seen throughout history, Christians occupy and kill and murder millions of Muslims in some areas. Jews will take Muslim homes for another millions and kill in some areas. Natural disaster, earthquake, tsunamis, tornadoes, wipe out hundreds and thousands of, like I remember when the great tsunami happened in Indonesia. How long did it last? A few minutes? Over nearly 250,000 people were dead. I think this was, if I remember correctly, uh, 2004, 2005, 2006, something like that, right? I don't remember the exact year. So Allah will cause these type of disasters. Allah will allow our enemies to occupy us when we disobey Him. It's not that the enemies are powerful, no. We disobeyed Allah, therefore Allah punishes us by allowing our enemies to overpower us. However, you have never seen and you will never see the entire Muslim Ummah being destroyed at the same time and all together being wiped out clean. Because this is the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. I don't want my nation to be destroyed altogether. The people of Lut ﷺ, completely destroyed. The people of Hud ﷺ, completely destroyed. Nuh ﷺ's people, the first Rasul of Allah, anyone who was not on his boat was wiped out, right? The people of Fir'aun, they rejected Musa Islam, drowned all of them, not a single one survived. So throughout history, those people who reject the Anbiya or Rusul, they were wiped out, not one of them even survived. But the Ummah of Muhammad, regardless of how much people reject Rasulullah Sallallahu Islam, all together will not be destroyed. The parts will be attacked and destroyed from parts, those who are guilty of rejecting Allah or turning away from Allah, they will be destroyed in parts, but not altogether. Alhamdulillah. Then Allah says, قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُضِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah is the one who either guides or misguides. You and I, we can go study the religion, become super knowledgeable, try our level best to sit with somebody and convince him of Tawheed, convince him of the authentic Sunnah. But if this man or woman's heart is not opened by Allah, he or she will never listen. Never. Wallahi, I remember uh, this was back when I used to live in Texas. This brother, he had the Kufr, Kufr al-Akbar, major Kufr of Wahdatul Wujud. Wahdatul Wujud means these people, they believe everything is Allah. Let me repeat. They believe everything is Allah. The tree that you see is Allah. The sun is Allah. The moon is Allah. I'm Allah. You're Allah. This is Kufr al-Akbar. Obviously, I mean, this is common sense. Any basic Muslim with some type of basic knowledge of Aqidah, he will know that this does not make sense. This is some really major kufr. So this person, he's praying, he's fasting, whatever it is. He, I, you know, he was a visitor to our masjid. And I, was, and I was still a student, right? So I gave khutbahs there sometimes, would lead salah. So the people knew me. So he came and he just wanted to talk to somebody. And it was the student masjid. It was the masjid that usually the university students, 90% of the attendees were all university students. So, you know, the brothers said, yeah, this brother, he, you know, he gives khutbahs, he gives classes and stuff like that. You can ask him some questions. So he's a visitor. I sat with him and he, he's, he tells me he's one of these people. So I said, Audhu Billah, brother, I don't want to answer any question. Let's talk about this. Wallahi, wallahi, from Asr Salah, because that's when I met him. And it was in summertime. So Asr is at 5. Isha was at 10, 4, 10.30. From Asr to Salat al-Isha, I sat with him, tried to convince him why Wahdatul Wujud is Kufr and Shirk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> then we prayed Salat al-Isha and I said, Brother, so what did you leave? You, do you want to, inshallah, leave that Aqidah and come to Ahlul Sunnah? He says, no. My Sheikh said, <laughs> my Sheikh said, 
this is what I have to believe in. This is out of our love and respect. Everything around us is Allah. I'm like, subhanAllah, right? So sitting with somebody for five, six hours, giving that one person your full attention, I mean, may Allah guide people. So, inna allaha yudillu may yasha. Allah will misguide whoever he wishes. That's why we always, always, we are sincerely asking, ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem. Guide us to the straight path. You have to ask this sincerely because you never know when Allah, because of something you did, Allah is so angry that He lets your heart divert away from His religion because it is Allah who will cause that to happen. وَيَهْدِي إِلَيْهِ مَنْ أَنَابَ And Allah finishes this ayah and He guides people. وَيَهْدِي إِلَيْهِ He guides people to Himself. مَنْ أَنَابَ whoever turns to him in repentance. Somebody might think, hey, it's kind of unfair. Why is Allah just going to, like, what does Allah do? Randomly decide who is going to be misguided and who's going to be guided? No. Allah is al-adl. He does not do injustice to anybody. The person in his heart, he doesn't deserve the huda, so Allah lets him go. Remember we covered before in this same surah, Allah will never can change your condition until you change what is uh, in yourselves, right? Allah will never uh, change anyone's condition until you change what is in yourselves. Uh, so here Allah is saying that He guides unto Himself whoever Man anab, whoever sincerely makes tawbah and returns to Allah. So if you are sincere, and of course Allah sees what's in your heart, if you're sincere, Allah will yahdi ilayhi. Allah will guide you to Himself, will get, make you get closer and closer and closer. But if there's something wrong with you, you're trying to play games with Allah, then of course Allah is going to misguide you further and further away. Uh, let's go to verse 28. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطَمَ إِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ So this is in connection. In the last verse, وَيَهْدِي إِلَيْهِ مَنْ أَنَابِ Allah will guide you as long as you are someone who sincerely turns to Him. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطَمَ إِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ So it's connected to this ending of verse 27 and the beginning of verse 28. Allah says, those who believe, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطَمَ إِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ and they find comfort, they find rest. They find comfort and rest bi dhikrillah. Whenever they remember Allah, whenever they say subhanallah, alhamdulillah, whenever they sit and read the Qur'an, because the name, one of the names of the Qur'an, as Allah says in the, in the Qur'an, is al-dhikr, the reminder. This is, or the remembrance. This is the best way that you can remember Allah. Recite the Qur'an, understand the Qur'an, and apply it. This is the absolute best way to remember your Lord. So when the people do that, those who have iman, alladina amanu, because it's only the believers who are going to do this. Somebody who doesn't have iman is not going to sit down and uh, listen to uh, the Qur'an, I mean, read the Qur'an. أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَ إِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ Indeed, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest? As a human being, let's say, of course, we're fasting now. We're not drinking, we're not uh, eating until it's time for Maghrib. And then we quench our thirst, we satisfy our hunger, and we feel the energy. Even when we're not fasting, throughout the day or night, when sometimes you might be hungry, you can't continue, you've been working really hard, you need to eat some food and uh, rejuvenate, get back your energy, because nourishment, that's what food does, this is the way Allah made our bodies, it needs food and drink, without which we will not have energy and eventually will die. So our bodies need food. Our eyes, we like looking at things that are very beautiful, right? Uh, evil people like looking at haram things, but even the believers, even when you see something nice, subhanAllah, a beautiful mountain, a beautiful creature, uh, like, so let's give a simple example. When you look at the tiger, I'm sure every single one of us, even the kuffar, 
they are amazed at the beauty of, of its creation. As Muslims, we know this is from Allah. He's the one who created this tiger in such a beautiful manner. Our eyes are pleased. Like, wow, what beautiful things that Allah has created. So uh, when we hear beautiful things, some people will thank you. Some people say loving words. Your spouse says loving words. We hear these. It pleases us. When we touch soft, silky material, we like it. Right? So everything, there is something to feed our senses. But the food of the soul is the dhikr of Allah. Never will you be satisfied in terms of your iman, in terms of your ruh, your soul, your heart, without the dhikr of Allah. This is why no matter how depressed you may be, no matter how depressed you may be, no matter what terrible musibah you have suffered, take a break, sit down and read the Qur'an, you will see that Allah puts sakina in your heart. Some people, they are so stressed out in life. We all have stress. All, every one of us. Stress is part of life. Some days are more, some days are less. But if you are at a point where because of the stress of this dunya, you need medicine to put you to sleep, this is something wrong. This means your soul is disconnected from the creator of it. Of, of it. You have to connect yourself to the dhikr of Allah. Ala bi dhikrillahi innul qulub. This is the only way the hearts will find rest. This is what the creator of the heart and the mind and the soul and the body is telling us. So medication, this. Some people when they're super depressed, what do they do? They go on a spending spree. Some people when they're super depressed, they sit with a big jar of ice cream and fatten themselves up, right? <laughs> different people have different reactions. However, the reaction of the believers, you will be sad. You will go through depressing things in life. Right, let's go to verse 29. Those who believe and perform righteous deeds. For them is Tuba and Husnu uh, Ma'ab, a nice, beautiful place to live in, uh, a beautiful place as a final destination. So, Alladina Amanu, because Iman, Iman itself is not enough. Wa Amilu Salihat, they are always paired together in the Quran, Iman and righteous deeds. Because if you really have faith in Allah, you will do what He told you to do. You'll do the righteous deeds. Otherwise, your belief is fake. It's a, just a lip service. So they will be given Tuba Lahum. What is Tuba? Ali radiallahu anhu and Abdullah ibn Abbas said Tuba, this word Tuba in this ayah, it refers to happiness. It refers to comfort. It, re it refers to every kind of re refreshment that the eyes, the ears, the heart can feel. So this is for the believers. It's an excellent reward for what the people have earned in this dunya. They get this comfort. They get this eternal joy. Never-ending happiness. وَحُسْنُ Ma'ab, And it's a beautiful place and final return. Now in the hadith, <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ, so that's one of the meanings of Tuba. Eternal, everlasting happiness and comfort. The other meaning we get from the Prophet ﷺ as well. So the Sahaba, they, of course, they didn't go away from the Prophet's inter interpretations. They added to the Prophet's interpretation by saying that this is comfort and eternal and everlasting happiness. So what did the Prophet ﷺ say regarding Tuba? Like the famous hadith in Sahih Muslim and others, that بَدَأَ الْإِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيَعُودُ كَمَا بَدَأَ غَرِيبًا فَتُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَاء um, Islam, when it first started, it was very strange because everybody's a mushri mushrik, a pi idol worshipper. Who is this? We're worshipping 300 some idols, we're making these things and bowing down and offering sacrifices and here comes Muhammad. He's saying that there's one Allah? What a strange thing. What type of weird religion is this? Right? Islam began as something strange. وَسَيَعُودُ كَمَا بَدَأَ And it will, بَدَأَ غَرِيبًا It will go back to being that strange. Look at the world today. 
The whole world is messed up. The more evil, the more haram that you can do, two thumbs up for you. And then all of a sudden you go as a Muslim, no, this is not the way to succeed in life, and, and especially not in the akhirah. This is wrong. And you start doing amar bil ma'roof, commanding what is good, nahi anil munkar, and you start forbidding what is evil. People will call you crazy and strange. Forget the non-Muslim world. Even among the Muslims, even in our own family, maybe Allah has guided you to tawheed and the sunnah, and your family in Ramadan, I'm sure those of you who are breaking your iftar the moment the sun is setting, I'm sure you might have relatives in your family who are still waiting. They're holding the date and they're looking, they're waiting for the mu'addin to finish, not realizing that the mu'addin breaks his own fast, then he starts giving the adhan. No, he's holding the date and he's waiting for the adhan to finish, maybe another 10 minutes, just to be sure. This is what the Yahud used to do, and there's clear hadith. The Jews would wait, would wait until the sun completely disappeared. This is not the way. And you try to teach your relatives this sunnah. The moment it's time for iftar, you have to make it. And they call you strange. No, what is this? We've never heard of this. Right? A Muslim woman. Maybe she's wearing the hijab and everything properly, and she's the only one in her family. And the other women are also Muslims. But the, what's wrong with you? We live in America. Why are you being so extreme? A, a Muslim woman gets shunned by the other women of her family. She looks, she's being looked at as something strange. So we live in those times and it will only get worse. The Muslims, the practicing Muslims look strange in front of the kuffar as well as in front of other Muslims. Just like the Prophet ﷺ promised, وَسَيَعُودُ كَمَا بَدَأَ غَرِيبًا it will become, the real Islam will become strange all over again. فَطُوبَى لِلْغُرَبَاء So Tuba for the strangers. Don't worry if you look strange or not. The real Islam, who cares if they're criticizing you for it? فَطُوبَى لِلْغُرَبَاء So in this ayah, Allah says that الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا صَالِحَاتِ Tuba لَهُمْ So same word. What did the Prophet ﷺ say is Tuba? In the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari from Anas radiallahu anhu, the Prophet said, "Inna fil jannati la shajaratan yasiru rakibu fi zilliha mi'ata amin. La yakata'u la yakata'uha." There is a tree. Tuba is a tree in Jannah, <coughs> which is so huge. Yasiru rakibu fi zilliha mi'ata am just to get out of its shadow it will take rakibu someone who's riding a horse or anything non-stop for 100 years it will take him just to get out of the shadow of that tree to pass its shadow that's how huge the tree is and not only that la <clears throat> Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, even after a hundred years of riding non-stop, he will still not be able to pass by it, pass the shadow of the tree. That's how humongous it is. So when the Prophet ﷺ says, Fatuba lil ghuraba, or Allah says, Alladina amanu wa amilu salihati tuba lahum, you have to think, Tuba is this tree in Jannah. How will someone see? inside of Jannah unless he is inside of Jannah. How is someone going to be able to see and witness a tree that's inside Jannah without actually being in Jannah? So the point is, Allah is saying, those who have Iman, those who do righteous deeds, they'll be in Jannah. The Prophet ﷺ is saying, those who are strange, they are able to hold on to the real Islam, no matter how much people are criticizing them and calling them strange. They are the ones who will go to, these strangers are the ones who will go to Jannah and see this tree. <coughs> so of course, none of these definitions of Tuba contradict each other because they are synonymous. Tuba is the tree in Jannah and when you are in Jannah, it means you will have everlasting happiness. Right? So this is the description. Uh, let's go to verse 30. Allah says, كَذَلِكَ أَرْسَلْنَاكَ فِي أُمَّةٍ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهَا أُمَمٌ لِتَتْلُوَ عَلَيْهِمُ الَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ Therefore we have sent you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to a community 
before whom other communities had uh, passed away, in order that you might recite unto them what has been revealed to you. So our Prophet ﷺ, what was his duty? لِتَتُلُوَ عَلَيْهِمُ الَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكِ so that you can recite. His job was to recite the Qur'an to the people. Allah spoke it to Jibreel alayhi salam. Jibreel alayhi salam came down, told it to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam memorized and told it exactly word for word to mankind. That was his job, to recite the ayat of Allah, what has been revealed to him, and to explain it, and to show how to live by it. That's it. That was his job. So as long as you deliver the message, you have done your duty. That was his job. His job was not to decree who's going to go to Jannah or Jahannam or who's going to be destroyed in this world and not. His job was to convey the message, recite the ayat, what's good and what's evil, what will happen to the good people, what will happen to the bad people, and some uh, beneficial reminders, stories that Allah mentioned through him. Through him. And through that, Allah, Allah is reminding the Prophet ﷺ in this ayah, uh, that there were قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهَا أُمَمٌ There were so many nations. Umam is the plural of Ummah. Ummah is one nation. Umam is many nations. So many nations before you, they came, they left, they, they got destroyed. Messengers came to them. They re the messengers recited my verses to them. They came, they got destroyed. Some believed, some, many didn't. So Allah is reminding that they might be mocking you. They might be, so remember we said in the beginning, some parts of Surah Ra'ad is about Allah's rububiyyah, then about the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, and to reassure the Prophet ﷺ not to worry about anything. So th these are part of those reassurance, uh, the ayat dealing with reassurance. That people came before you, nations came before you, they rejected their prophets and messengers, they got destroyed. Victory will never be given to the disbelievers. وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَنِ As Allah continues in verse 30. And they disbelieved. وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَنِ They disbelieved in Ar-Rahman, most gracious. That these people we sent to you, uh, these people to whom we sent, they are disbelieving in Ar-Rahman. Think of the previous nations who also disbelieved their messengers. They got taken care of. So you're, you're, not, you're no different. You're no different. So relax. Be in comfort. These people reject and disbelieve in Ar-Rahman. In this ayah, Allah specifically says, وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَنِ they di He didn't say that they disbelieve in their Lord or Allah or the Creator. Specifically, this name of Allah, Ar-Rahman the most gracious. Why is it the case? Because the Quraysh, they had some kind of sickness. This pagan Arab had a disease. They refused to take the name of Ar-Rahman. They refused to say that Allah is Ar-Rahman. So much so, if you look through uh, the biography of the Prophet Wasallam, when you read about uh, the treaty of Al-Hudaybiyah, you will notice that <clears throat> they did not, they refused. When the Prophet ﷺ wanted to start with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, they refused, do not write. And they said, We don't know who Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim is. Allah, they affirmed, they knew that there is Allah who's the creator. So you can say Bismillah, but who is this Ar Rahman and Ar Rahim? We don't know and we don't accept. So the Mushrikun, the Arab pagans, they had this habit. They had this belief. This is why Allah says here, وَهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِالرَّحْمَنِ And they reject Ar-Rahman, even though that is Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us as a um, counter-argument to that incident. In Surah Isra, He tells us, قُلِ دِعُوا اللَّهَ أَوِ دِعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ قُلِ دِعُوا اللَّهَ أَوِ دِعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ Call Allah as Allah, or call Him as Ar-Rahman. It doesn't matter which name you use to call Him with, to Him belongs the most beautiful names. 
So Allah doesn't care. You don't want to call me a Rahman, you want to just stick to Allah, it does not matter. To Allah belongs all the beautiful names. So call on Allah, you want to call him, make dua to Allah, Ya Allah, or you want to say Ya Rahman, doesn't matter. Right? When you're making the dua, Allah, Rahman. Or you're calling him by a Rahman. It does not matter. Then Allah continues in verse 30. قُلْ هُوَ رَبِّي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ Say to these people who disbelieve in Ar-Rahman, who disbelieve in this message that you are reciting, قُلْ Tell them, هُوَ رَبِّي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ This, all of this that I'm saying, and I'm being commanded by, and who I'm telling you to worship, He is my Lord, Rabbi. هُوَ رَبِّي He is my Lord. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ there is no deity worthy of worship except him. Just convey this message to them. What does this emphasize? They're mocking you. They're criticizing you. They're rejecting you. Remind yourself that Allah is my Lord. La ilaha illallah. So this means, you know, forcefully, proudly, publicly say that Allah is your Lord, that you believe in Allah. And there's no deity worthy of worship except him, and that you worship him alone. Say this out loud. Alayhi tawakkaltu wa ilayhi matab. And then Allah ends this verse. So, قُلْ هُوَ رَبِّ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلْتُ وَإِلَيْهِ matab. And in him I trust. I trust Allah alone. I trust him. I know whatever he's willing to do, he's allowing to happen. This is the best option. So I have full trust in Allah. Wa ilayhi matab. And I return to him. Matab. The one who does tawbah. So I return to him. So Allah, and, and, and actually brothers and sisters, this is from the sunnah of Allah. When you are met with people whom you think are overpowering you, rejecting you, whatever is making you feel uncomfortable, Remind yourself that Allah is your Lord. La ilaha illallah. Uh, Remind uh, yourself that you are supposed to have tawakkul ala Allah. You're supposed to make tawbah to Allah. Remind yourself of these things and you'll see inshallah that you feel strength again. And you're not overpowered by the people's criticisms. Then in verse 31, let's go to verse 31. Walau anna so now Allah is giving a verse where it talks about the miraculous nature of the Qur'an. The miraculous nature of the Qur'an. What is Allah saying? If there was any Qur'an by which the mountains would be removed or the earth would be broken apart, or the dead people will start talking. If there is any other Qur'an that can make these things happen, it would be this Qur'an. <coughs> because there is no other Qur'an, right? There's only one Qur'an. So if there is any Qur'an that would remove the mountains, break apart the earth, or cause dead people to talk, it will be this Qur'an. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the Qur'an that has been given to the Prophet ﷺ, and he reminds him uh, as to why this divine revelation is superior to the previous divine revelations. So if there was a book ever in the previous, in previously or afterwards or other than the Qur'an, then it would be able to do all these things. But there isn't. This is it. This is the only Qur'an, and if any Qur'an was able to do it, it would be this Qur'an. And this Qur'an is more worthy is more eloquent. It is superior to the previous books that were revealed. So Allah then says, بَلْ لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ جَمِيعًا But the decision of all things is with Allah. So if there was any Qur'an that could destroy the mountains, break apart the earth, cause the dead people to talk, it would be this Qur'an. However, لِلَّهِ, لله الْأَمْرُ جَمِيعًا only Allah controls all decision or the decision maker of all things is Allah. If he decides this, it will happen. If he doesn't, it's not going to happen. The decision, the decision over all affairs is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. 
whatever he wills occurs and whatever he does not will never occurs and and the previously allah mentioned he guides whomever he wills and he misguides whomever he wills that's his decision you cannot go against his no there's literally no one from his creation that can defy the decree of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the decisions of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so allah then says afalam yayasil ladina amanu afalam yayasil ladina amanu have uh, have they not seen those who believed have have not then those who believed yet known so those who believe don't they recognize don't they understand that not all people will believe and understand the beauty of this quran that not all people will believe in the message of allah and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this is talking to us and the prophet remember he's reassuring him he's being sad that people are rejecting afalam yayas alladhina amanu so all of these things do not like the believers you have to realize this as believers as sad and bad as it sounds we know for a fact not all people will be guided to islam not all muslims will be guided to the sunnah that's the reality this is it you cannot think about this and kill yourself about it you go somewhere you give dawa uh i don't know maybe the masjid has a few hundred people if you are expecting that all these people are going to change and come to tawhid and sunnah you are severely mistaken we never have that expectation we hope of course we hope but expecting realistic expectations we know for a fact that will never happen anywhere anywhere even in mecca even in masjid al haram you find people sitting there staring at the kaaba and he's raising his hands ya abdul qadir al jilani ya hasan ya hussein ya muhammad even in a place like that in a masjid like that they refuse to understand tawhid and they want to stick to their shirk path shirk paths so it is impossible for anyone to expect that here's a muslim community here's an islamic center here's a masjid 100% of the people are going to adopt tawhid in in speech in belief and in manners or the sunnah in speech in actions and manners it is impossible it will not happen go to a masjid where the imam is on the sunnah the board is on the sunnah i mean he is the board and he has few people helping him right go to any masjid that even scholars have started it is their project shuyukh have started you'll still see people who are part of that community who don't care about the sunnah or who have wretched manners wretched foul mouth like there's a lot of wrong things with them it happens everywhere you cannot expect 100% of the people to be guided properly so give up that expectation don't hurt yourself if you expect too much and it doesn't happen you end up hurting yourself be realistic listen to what allah is saying and law yasha allah lahada an-nas jami'an had allah willed he could have guided all of humanity if allah wanted to he can guide all of humanity however <clears throat> allah didn't do that allah wills not to do that wala yazalu alladhina kafaru tusibuhum bima sana'u qari'atun aw tahullu qariban min darihim and disaster will not cease to strike those who disbelieve because of their evil deeds or it settles close to their home the disaster might not strike them directly but it will come close to their home the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith in sahih al-bukhari he said that ma min al-anbiya an-nabiyyun illa u'tiya min al-ayati ma mithluhu umina او امن عليه البشر the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said there was no prophet from the messengers and the prophets that allah had sent except that he was sent with a sign a miracle with which the people would believe in him wa innama kana alladhi 
utitu wahyan aw hahu Allah ilayya however me the miracle that i have been given is the revelation the wahi that allah has revealed to me what is that the quran and because of that fa arju anni aktharuhum tabi'an yawm al qiyamah and because this miracle will last forever the previous messengers miracles are gone it died out Because I have this miracle that will last forever, I hope I will have the largest followers on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And that's true. The Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam will be the largest Ummah ever. No prophet or messenger had so many followers like Muhammad Wasallam. So this is Allah's way of saying that this Qur'an is the miracle that's been given to you. Don't expect everybody, then this Qur'an is super powerful. It can wipe out all the mountains, split the earth open, make the pe- dead people talk, had Allah willed for that to happen. This Qur'an is that powerful because these are the words of Allah. Don't be sad that not everybody is believing in you because it's from Allah's decision. Had Allah willed, He could have guided the entire humanity, but He doesn't do that. And then He warns that, وَلَا يَزَالُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا تُصِيبُهُمْ بِمَا صَنَعُوا Uh, the disbelievers will continue to suffer the the adab, the punishment, the consequences of their of their rejection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qari'ah, qari'atun, this is, as the Sahaba explained, this is a disaster or it can mean affliction. It can mean a disaster or some type of affliction. So either they will physically suffer the disaster or um, affliction, or it will be uh, dropped right close to their homes, where they can at least feel feel the effects of that destruction or affliction. Until until the promise of Allah comes to pass. Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. This part that hatta ya'tiya wa'adullah until the promise of Allah comes into existence. This ayah according to the salaf had two meanings. Because this ayah was specifically talking about these Meccans. But in gen- in also in the general sense it refers to all the disbelievers. It's a reassurance to all the believers. Don't worry if they are being you're being rejected, they're making fun of you and things like that. This Qur'an is the final word. Not all people will be uh, guided by Allah. So the specific message is referring to the Meccans. The general message, إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ Referring to all the non-Muslims. So some of the Salaf, they said, حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ وَعَدُ اللَّهِ Until the promise of Allah is fulfilled. What is this promised? They said that this is referring to فَتْحُ Makkah, The conquest of Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ was thrown out of Mecca. People mocked him and threw him out. Well, guess what? Allah is going to repay the Prophet ﷺ. He is going to regain his home. And the promise of Allah will be fulfilled. So some of the Salaf said, Hatta يَأْتِيَ وَعَدُ الله. The promise, until the promise of Allah will be fulfilled. This is referring to the conquest of Mecca. Others from the Salaf said, this is referring to يَوْمُ Qiyamah. So if you look at, if it's being referred to specifically about the Meccans, then of course the Fathul Mecca makes sense. And if it's being referred to the target audience is the general uh, non-Muslim throughout human history, I mean, throughout till the Day of Judgment, then of course that this means what is that promise of the Allah that's going to be fulfilled is Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. And surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not uh, break His promise. Uh, he doesn't break his promise. So if he promises something, it will happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells in another place in the Quran, فَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ اللَّهَ مُخْلِفَ وَعَدِهِ رُسُلَهُ So do not ever think, Allah is telling the Prophet wasallam, do not ever think that Allah will fail in his promise to his messengers. إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَزِيزٌ ذُو انْتِقَامٌ Indeed, Allah is the mighty, the almighty, and the owner of retribution. So this is a reassurance to uh, the Prophet ﷺ, that don't worry, 
They are rejecting you. They are mocking you. They are throwing you out of your house. It's all good. The promise of Allah has always been fulfilled to each and every messenger before. It is going to be fulfilled to you as well. And Allah is in Allah Azizun Dun Tiqam. He is the Almighty owner of retribution. He will give you your retribution that you need. So inshallah ta'ala, <clears throat> let's stop here.